All right. Uh, I would like to thank Rafi and the uh, organizing committee for setting up a splendid birthday for our country. Uh, absolutely amazing week. And uh, as Jim said, uh, happy birthday for Rafi as well. Um, I'm going to give a talk that uh, covers uh, about two decades of method development and a particular biological story that we have been using that method over the years. Uh, basically, uh, the next step after the beautiful structures that you have seen is trying to see these structures at work. So uh, I would argue that my, one of the uh, big um, challenges for the future would be to have methods for dynamic structural biology. This is a work of many people. Uh, the transcription story that I'm going to uh, talk about is done by uh, mostly Eitan, who just <coughs> on the way to uh, Jerusalem, he spent five, time, uh, five years at UCLA, just got a position here at Hebrew U, and he's going to join the staff of Life Sciences, Sangyun and Yazan. Uh, helped by three uh, very talented undergrads, uh, support from senior people in the lab, and collaboration with the group of uh, Bill Gelbart, uh, Ron University, Sergei Borokov, CNRS Stern Streak, and the University of Colorado, uh, Dylan Tadgett, and former collaborator, uh, the group of Richard Ebright from Rutgers, Achilles Kapanidis, who initially was in my group, and now he's in Oxford, and Emmanuel Bagit. I'll also be talking about the evolution of single molecule threat, uh, and I highlight here the people who have made the major contribution for the method development in red. Uh, first and foremost, Akchip Ha, who was a student in the lab, Maxim, Ted, Achilles, Eyal, Namki, Antonio, Eitan, and Xavier. All right, so uh, when we take two fluorescence dyes, donor and acceptor, we bring one very close to each other, they start to talk to each other, and we heard quite a bit about this when we talked about the history uh, of, of chemistry here in Israel. Uh, fluorescence resonant energy transfer, or more accurately, Forster resonant energy transfer, uh, is depicted here in, in this Jablonski diagram. Uh, basically, we excite the donor, donor emits photons, but if in the presence of the acceptor, instead of basically emitting photons, it can radiationlessly move excitations to the acceptor, and then we'll get acceptor photons. And this transfer is actually operating by dipole-dipole interaction, uh, and basically taking the dipole-dipole interaction uh, semi-classically together with the Ablonsky diagram that depicts the quantum feature of the, of the two die systems, first worked out the theory in the late 40s, uh, so in 46, he published the first paper, and basically the most important uh, attribute of, of that analysis is that the energy transfer efficiency scales like one over the distance to the sixth power. That means that this transfer efficiency is very sensitive to the distance between donor and acceptor, and in principle, this could be used as a molecular ruler. So here is a famous uh, graph that describes this formula. We chose that the threat efficiency is very high at very short distances, it's very low at uh, large distances, and you have here a more or less linear regime that is useful for uh, measuring distances. This was realized uh, by uh, Stry and Hagland in the mid-60s. Uh, the idea would be, if you can do spectroscopic measurements, uh, we can basically look at the combination of donor and acceptor and look at the full spectrum. So if you have lots of donor spectrum, that means that the two dyes are far apart. If we see mostly acceptor emission and little donor emission, that means that the two dyes are close by. And Stray and Hagelin basically uh, demonstrated this molecular ruler. The title of the uh, paper in PNAS in 67 was a molecular ruler. They basically synthesized a polypropylene peptide and put donor and acceptor on the two ends and had peptides of different lengths and very nicely showed this curve here. The center of gravity of that new field of measuring uh, molecular distances moved actually to this place here. And we heard a lot on the first day of the meeting about the work of uh, Kaczarski, Katsir, uh, Katsir, Steinberg, and Haas. Well, Katsir was interested in peptides with the help of, of Steinberg and Haas developed uh, many uh, improvements over the initial 
threat measurement uh, by Stride Hagoland, and basically really established the field of using threat as a molecular ruler on the ensemble level. And one could imagine if you have a molecular ruler, you can do a lot of interesting measurements. You can basically do intramolecular measurements where you follow moving parts within the same macromolecule, or you can put the donor acceptor on two different species and look at intermolecular threat, for example, enzymes that binds DNA or different other species. So many advantages. You can basically use this method for both in vitro and in vivo distance measurements. You can get close to near angstrom resolution, and you have very good sensitivity. Fluorescence is basically a very sensitive method. Now, all I think I have to, can I get help here? Just a minute. I have some animation, uh, animation that I think are essential. So let's see if that works. Yeah. All right, so if we put such first trying to press on this button here. Okay. So all the measurements, starting Hargoland, the Katir group, uh, over the years were basically the measurements that you see here. In your test tube, you have many molecules. In this case, we show intramolecular uh, molecules, so donor and acceptor, basically the distance is fluctuating. And when you do a sample measurement, you basically measure a constant uh, signal for the donor and a constant signal for the acceptor if you calculate FRET you basically get one value. That's the average. Of course, if you now go, instead of in, to an ensemble measurement, you go to a single molecule measurement, the situation is very, decent, di very different. You are now able to look at fluctuations, and you basically can measure the uh, fluctuations in the distance between the two parts, or basically you can use this molecular ruler to look at moving parts of the molecular machine, Instead of having a single value for the threat, now you get histograms, you can separate some populations. So that could be basically a very good thing. So, all right. So indeed, we were able to show uh, that single molecule threat can be uh, measured on a single molecule level. This is the air very early work in 96. We had uh, DNA, we put on an acceptor on DNA, on a dry uh, sur glass surface, and we were able to show that when acceptor photo bleach, the spectrum shifts, and that was the proof that indeed we are looking at a single molecule threat uh, case. So Fraser talked earlier in the week about molecular machines, uh, different type of molecular machines, uh, man-made, designed molecular machines. He talked also and gave many examples of macro-scale uh, man-made machines. Uh, I would argue that if you are looking at molecular machines, uh, living molecular machines, um, we don't have the design rules, and in order to understand structure-function relationship, we really have to be able to measure the moving parts. If we design machines, we more or less have an idea what the moving parts should be. So very early on, uh, this is kind of a slide that I used to show 20 years ago when we just came up with, with the method. Uh, if you can do the single molecule measurement uh, threat measurement, you should be able to follow protein folding, you should be, we talked a beautiful, uh, we heard from Brody a beautiful talk about F1, F0, ATPS, you should be able to see the rotary motion, you should be able to see enzymes that process DNA and walk over DNA, um, so that was the vision. And uh, that vision was outlined in a paper that we published in 99, basically outlining all kinds of different possibilities, but still really in terms of, of vision. Uh, this is what happened since uh, more than 4,000 publications, more than 86,000 mentions of, of uh, the method. And so it's widely adopted by many, many groups. It's used to analyze many different macromolecules in many different situations. And uh, just earlier this year, we wrote a review that summarized the past 20 years and also make some uh, predictions and suggestions for grand challenges uh, for the future. So 
Uh, in particular, I will talk about high throughput way of doing this. Uh, there is a very beautiful work of doing single molecular thread inside living cells. Um, and now I really want to uh, put an emphasis on how we do the measurements and then move from there to the biology that we do with this. So there are two main formats for single molecule threat. One is the molecules are freely diffusing in solution. In this case, we'll have a focused laser beam into the solution, and we get short bursts of photons, both donor and acceptor uh, photons. For each burst, we can calculate threat efficiency. From that, we can extract threat histograms, and we basically get ac access to states, to, to subpopulations. The other uh, uh, format is basically mobilizing mo the molecule on the surface, and now you can basically do non-equilibrium uh, reactions. You can basically add something to the chamber and follow changes in the structure as a function of time. My group is mostly working with the solution-based uh, format. So we basically we take a high NA objective, focus the light very tightly, and basically each time a molecule comes by, we, we can uh, basically tabulate and Within a few tenths of within a few minutes, we actually get very good statistics. So basically, molecules diffuse through that confocal spot. We collect and photon count the donor photons and the acceptor photons. Data looks like this. Here are the two colors are overlaid for each burst. They're representing one molecule going through the confocal spot. We can calculate the threat efficiency, and from that we build basically a histogram. So if you have a mixture, in this case, you see a high threat subpopulation. This is short distance. Here you see another population of a larger distance. But this measurement is also uh, suffering from the fact that if you have uh, poorly labeled molecules where you have only donor molecules or the acceptor photo bleached, you'll have a peak here that you can really cannot separate large distances states from donor-only states. To solve that problem, we developed what we call the Alex spectroscopy module. So Instead of having this simple single laser excitation, we have two lasers. We very quickly alternate between the two lasers. And we basically get more, more information to define two different ratios, the freight ratio and the stoichiometry ratio. And that converts this whole apparatus to basically single molecule flow cytometer. And you can get the same type of things you can do with flow cytometer. You can really focus on species of interest. You can electronically purify your sample and look at what is interesting. So that brings me to the biology, and we heard uh, Sunny beautifully uh, introduce the uh, central dogma of biology and talked about transcription. So uh, in each uh, cell in our body, uh, the genome is encoded in the DNA in order to really end up with the machine. Those are the proteins that do the work. The DNA uh, genetic information is basically transcribed by the enzyme called RNA polymerase to messenger RNA and then the ribosome basically uh, converts that information into the chain of, poly, uh, of amino acids to form the protein. There is one addition to this uh, very good uh, depiction of the central dogma, which is protein degradation. So I would argue that Israel has very nice representation of the central dogma. We still need somebody to win a Nobel Prize in uh, replication. Uh, hopefully that will come soon. Uh, and my group has used single molecule threat mostly to study transcription, study RNA polymerase. So I'm going to show you several different results on RNA polymerase that we acquired over the years. Here is the bacterial transcription cycle. In order for the enzyme to copy the genetic code and generate a messenger RNA, the enzyme needs to find the promoter, binds the DNA in the right place, open a transcription bubble, if nucleotides are being provided, it will start to transcribe. What happens at this point, it, for most strong promoters, the enzyme will start transcription, abort it, make a short transcript that is being released, try again, try again, try again. Think about old VW uh, air-cooled, going up a steep hill, the engine basically shut off in the middle of the wheel, hill, and the enzyme slides, and, and the machine, the car slides back, try again, try again. And if there is enough thermal energy, it will go over the hump. And at that point, the enzyme basically leaves the promoter and is committed to go very possessively all the way to termination. So there is a huge difference between initiation, which is non-possessive, to elongation, which is highly possessive. The enzyme then, the bubble collapses to a much smaller bubble. The enzyme goes all the way to termination. 
the message is being released, all the components are being released, are being available for the next cycle. So uh, just the nomenclature. Here is a transcription bubble. The enzyme is already bound to the promoter. Here are the nucleotides coming from uh, uh, the secondary channel. And uh, that's just the, the upstream uh, DNA is here. This is downstream DNA. Promoter template strand. This is information that we want to basically copy. This is a non-template strand. This is a transcription bubble. The active sites where it additional nucleotides are added and forming a covalent bond to the going chain. This is the RNA transcript. Trigger loops that basically control how the nucleotides come in. That those are the NTPs, transcription sites. Here we have the exit channel. This is where the RNA is going to come out of the enzyme. And initially, during initiation, this is blocked. Think about the cork at the end of, of a wine bottle. Uh, Sigma region 3.2 is basically uh, closing this uh, point here, and we'll come back to that point later. Uh, all right, so what I'm going to do, try to describe now are three different steps within initiation itself. So I showed you the whole circle, uh, bacterial transcription circle. Uh, we are going to focus just on initiation. Initiation is basically the most important step in transcription. Initiation is at the heart of gene regulation, gene expression and gene regulation. This is where all the feedback loop basically comes in. And there are many steps within this initiation that gives opportunity for different factors to come and affect this feedback loop. So I'm going to talk uh, initially, and I'm not going to present what the work that we've done in a chronological order. I'm going to present it in this order of basically the cycle. So first we'll talk about the open complex. This is actually a very recent work. Then we'll talk about abortive initiation. This is older work. And then promoter escape, also recent work. And virtually uh, some ex excursion to the most difficult uh, system. That's a human poll too. And we are making some he uh, heads, uh, nice heads, uh, towards uh, doing the same type of analysis for the human poll too. All right. So the open complex, here you see a crystal structure. This is solved, and you see the transcription bubble. This is upstream, downstream. And basically, we make a large library of DNA promoters where we put donor and acceptor, and we classify those uh, promoters as scratchy coordinate, where the donor and acceptor are actually telling us something about the bubble being stretched or being closed. Or the two dyes are on the bubble, and they gave us this vertical coordinate where the bubble is basically being squished or being opened. Here is a list of all these uh, promoters. And basically, we subject this library to two tests. We want to see that the bubble is open. Uh, that's one test. The other one is that we are able to go above the initiation into elongation, so we get activity. And the highlighted uh, uh, promoters in yellow are active. They go through all the tests, so we can work with those. And I won't go through the analysis, but there is a lot of analysis going into this type of uh, data where we try to analyze not only get distances between the dyes, but also tell uh, we, we can actually say something about how stable that distance is or either any fluctuations. Uh, distance uh, that comes from uh, basically fluctuations uh, between the in the bubble or in, in between the, the sites. So uh, th there is a flow of analysis. I'm not going to explain the analysis. Just this is the, 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 the flow, how we do those analysis. And I just go here to the salary. What we find on these nine promoters that we were able, uh, that they were active, we find that each one represents actually not one distance, but two distances. So that already very strongly suggests that the bubble is not in one state, there are two states for the bubble in the open complex even before you add nucleotides. And here is one set of distances and we have 100% full agreement with the crystal structure. In the second case, we actually have big deviations. And what that really means is that the bubble fluctuates even before you provide it with its fuel, the nucleotides. And uh, there is some discussion in the literature that the bubble might do that. And this has to do with something called uh, trans um, as, as transition start site selection. So um, there are 
different isoforms of transcripts that start at different positions, and uh, depending on different uh, on gradients of concentration of different nucleotides, you can actually tra start the transcript at different places. And we think that the mechanism for this has to do with this type of fluctuations. So this is one story. Second story is uh, uh, an older story. This is a story that actually was discovered in the early 80s in my own department, way before I arrived to UCLA by Jay Guala, who did a very interesting experiment for the abortive initiation. I explained the abortive initiation, the old VW that goes up the, the hill and, and the engine shuts off. Basically what he found out, he did a, an experiment called footprinting experiment. In this experiment, you basically cross-link the enzyme to the DNA, you chop off all the exposed DNA, and then you release the protected DNA and you analyze it in a gel. So when you look at the protection along in the elongation state, it doesn't matter where the enzyme is, in elongation, the protection is always the same. However, if you do the same trick in initiation, that's not the case. And you can trap the enzyme in initiation by starving it with one or two nucleotides, so it will, it will never escape into elongation. And when you do that, you find out that the protection basically is sharp on the upstream, uh, on the upstream uh, side and, and basically very different uh, uh, on, on the downstream side. So uh, that was a big puzzle in the field for many, many years. Uh, basically, there was no method that would allow to try to mechanically explain why the transcript uh, in abortive initiation look very different than in elongation. So, over the years, because this phenomena could not be explained, people came up with three different models. The first model is called the inch warming model. Basically, it attributes conformational changes to the enzyme itself. Here is a transcription bubble. The enzyme stretches like basically an inchworm. So the backside of the enzyme is staying put on the promoter, but the leading edge is moving forward, loses the transcript, try again, try again. So that's one model to explain the, 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 this footprinting. The next model is not conformational changes in protein, but conformational changes in the DNA. So the enzyme basically pulls on the DNA and the bubble grows loses a transcript and do it again. And the last concept is a concept really coming from single molecule experiment. This is basically the enzyme sits for most of the time in the back position, make very brief transcript, it slides back and doing it again and again. So now with our molecular ruler, we can basically go and test all these models. So we can look at the downstream distance. All three models predict that there will be a shortening of that distance. So that's a good control experiment. And here is the measurement. So this is the open complex. And we add nucleotides. And you can see that the cloud here shifted to the right. So indeed, we see that motion of the enzyme. The control works. The transient excursion uh, model basically predicts changes in the backside of the enzyme. And the measurements show that absolutely no distant change. So we can already rule one model out of the three. And the DNA scrunching model basically predicts that there will be changes in the bubble size. So if we put these dyes upstream and downstream of the bubble and do the experiment. So here you see two populations. One is the complex, and here you have the free DNA. You add the nucleotide, and you see that this cloud here shifts to the right, and that basically shows that indeed scrunching is in charge here. So this measurement was repeated for many different positions, and conclusion is very clear. Since this worked in 2006, this basically point was put to rest, and many people accept the scrunching as the operating mechanism for initiation. The last story is a kinetic story, and that has to do with what is happening within uh, the uh, initiation. So here we basically add nucleotides, we get to position seven, and the transcript basically pushes the cork. And here there is a balance of forces. So either the cork basically is removed, and then transcription proceeds all the way to the end of the exit channel. At this point, basically, sigma falls off. We are committed to go all the way to elongation, and a full transcript is generated. The bubble shrinks at that point and you go all the way to termination. 
Another option is that the, due to you know, the thermal uh, agitation at exactly this point, this force basically wins, and at that point, the transkip is lost, and this is really the abortive initiation. So uh, as I told you, for strong promoters, we get many cycles like this. So basically, the common model for this was that you go from the open complex up to position seven, and here you have a branching. Either you lose transkip and you start again and again, and if so happened you had enough energy to go over the hump, you go all the way to elongation and termination. And we wanted to look into this more carefully, so uh, we basically designed a new assay. In this case, we are not really doing a pure single molecule experiment. We are preparing the system at different positions in initiation by starving it by one, two, three nucleotides. So here we can, on these different uh, promoters, we can have position two, position four, position seven, and on this one we can have position two, six, and 11. Now we can march the enzyme to, let's say, position seven, and then add the missing nucleotides and look at the kinetics of transcription. So this is, we do this by hybridizing a probe to the transcript and then analyzing at different time points. So we basically do a quench kinetic assay. We have multiple test tubes. In each test tube, we run reaction, but we stop it at different times. And then we add the probe and read. From that, we get a kinetic curve. So here is when we start from position zero, that's a kinetics of transcription. When we start at position 11, which is already the first stable elongation position, you would expect the reaction to run a little bit faster, but what we find is exactly the same speed. But if we start in the middle at position seven, we get a surprising result. We see a much slower reaction, and that really is very puzzling. So, to try to understand what is this slower kinetics, we basically tested several different uh, possibilities. So one possibility has to do with pausing. Pausing is known to occur in elongation, but it did, uh, the people did not know that pausing can actually happen in initiation. Pausing means that once the transcript is going back through the uh, secondary channel, uh, it can get stuck. At that point, basically, the enzyme itself has uh, nuclease activity, it can cut this extruding RNA and then prime it to basically continue with uh, synthesis. But there is actually an enzyme in the cell that is supposed to do this uh, nuclease reaction much faster. So that's called GRI A. If you add this enzyme, it helps catalyze this cutting of the RNA much faster. So what happens? for our slow kinetics if we add GRI A to the mix, and we get basically much accelerated reaction. So basically what we were able to prove here is that in initiation we identified a new pause backtrack state uh, that was not known before, uh, and we could revise the model for initiation. Uh, I won't go into the details because we don't have much time left. Uh, and just very quickly, we now do the exact same type of assays on a much more complicated system. The, the bacterial system has five proteins. The human system has 300 proteins to make the same reaction. And this all has to do with feedback loops. So it's a much harder system to work with. We are collaborating with uh, the group of Dylan Taget from Colorado on this. We have purified components so we can reconstitute the system. And using the bubble opening assay, as you can see here, uh, we see, we, you see here, for example, when we add uh, NTPs, we uh, increase the bubble size. And here is uh, an assay where we add a transcription factor called TF2H, and you can see changes of maintenance of that bubble with TF2H. But the more more, most recent results that we have, this is similar to the kinetics measurement that I showed, which is looking at a transcript. Uh, we are actually finding something very interesting, and Sunny was talking about transcription bursting. In human pole two, this is much more complicated. People believe that bursting has to do with maintaining, after the enzyme left the promoter and goes into elongation, the transcription bubble itself is not falling apart. It's maintained. There is a whole machinery of protein keeping that bubble open such that the enzyme can come again and again. So if you want to express 
the same protein but at high copy number very quickly, you would like to not waste all this energy that went to assembly of the peak at the promoter and keeping the, the transcription bubble open. And we actually uh, now see that when we add a particular factor called DSIF that wasn't really known until now what it is doing, it was known that it is in this assembly, we add it and we very nicely see that it basically helps maintain the bubble and uh, accelerate the activity. So that's up and coming. Um, the last thing I just want to emphasize that all these tools to look at dynamic structure are interesting. Uh, RNA polymerase is a huge target for antibiotics, and you all are familiar with the resistance. But once we have a picture not of the static structure, all drugs always have been screened for static states. Imagine that we have access now to dynamic states and think about putting a peg inside a bicycle uh, wheel and basically stop the motion. Uh, there are many more opportunities to look for drugs and develop new antibiotics once you have the dynamic picture. So I'll skip that. And last thing is about the challenge. So I've shown you there are several different crystal structure in the PDB of the cycle. So this is open complex, this is ITC4, uh, IT7, uh, and this is RD11, and uh, WA showed some uh, morphing, so we can play morphing as well, but I've shown you an intermediate that is not known, and its morphing is not going to give us this, uh, this intermediate. So here you see morphing from our close complex to RPO, here you see morphing of the bubble, morphing of uh, going from RPO to ITC4, and morphing from ITC4 to RD11. But what we really, really want to do is to have a full atomic, say, 3D structure movies. And I would argue that's the next big challenge for structural biology. And the way to do this, uh, we have some of the components. This is work we did with Steve Craig on microfluidics, basically automating sample exchange. Uh, you want to have non-equilibrium reaction, basically. And the way to do it, you use a a mixer, a continuous flow mixer, you flow in your complexes, the enzyme bound to DNA, you flow in the NTPs from here and here, and then the velocity and distance translate basically to time. So each time point here represents different time point in the reaction. Now think that we have a library of many point mutations where we put dyes in different positions. It's enough, and Arya was here earlier, if you do CG uh, coarse grain simulations, uh, molecular dynamic simulations, uh, you can actually, if you have the structure already and then you have just hinge motion of several different parts, by having several different constraints, you can actually do the computation quite uh, reasonably fast. So we are setting up to build this vision of putting a library of labeled molecules at different positions, going through that mixer. We develop unique detectors that allows us to do all those Measurements, multi-spot measurement at the same time, so we had to develop uh, unique spot arrays to do that, the, mic the microfluidic device, the optics that allows us to have multiple confocal spots in the solution all at the same time, and the flow of doing the calculation and the structure solving to eventually be able to pl play a full movie of a molecular machine going from the open complex all the way to elongation. So that's my grand challenge. Thank you for your attention. And Thanks for people who did the work. <laughs> sure. Thank you very much for this fantastic travel into the fundamentals of uh, biological functions. Our comments, questions? Jim. Yeah, Jim. Yeah, I have a question. I, I think it's either for you or, or Sunny or both. Something that's emerged over the past few years is that many cancer cells, when threatened with a targeted inhibitor, will within as many as, as short as two or three hours, will undergo a cell state change and a complete chromatin remodeling. And that's, it kind of touches on the sort of experiments that you talked about and what Sonny talked about, but it's basically a concerted reorganization of the entire nucleus. Well, I, but and I I'm think that- how one, how does one look at the biophysics of that? Well, I, I'm, what I showed here is very basic biochemistry, basically, in vitro biochemistry. 
In the future, you would like to be, be able to do this inside live cells, and there are some initial experiments going in this direction. But I think the question that you are asking has to do more with morphological changes and mechanics of cells in tissues. And that's basically the signaling that activates, for example, EMT. So there are very large arrangements. If you have just the, the, the focal adhesions, if, if there is a change in focal adhesion, uh, you have, you know, in tissue, cells touch each other and they touch the extracellular matrix. If uh, you have some changes there and you have already uh, several mutations, uh, P53 and, and RAS, KRAS, you know, one more trigger and it could be even mechanical, that would be enough. Other comments, questions over there? Any so more? I just want to go back to your almost Number first, three, and that's the last one. first couple of slides on FRET. Um, how accurate is the FRET for distances between the donor okay. and acceptor that are small yeah. when there begins to be significant right. so, overlap? So there has been tremendous work done over the past 20 years. We used to think that single molecule fret, in contrast to ensemble fret, will be better for looking at changes, not at absolute distances, because absolute distances are very important, are very difficult. You have the issues of dipole orientation, kappa square, all kinds of different things, uh, quenching, blinking. I, I don't want to go into this. We are actually writing a very comprehensive paper that will be uh, published in JCP on all these issues. Uh, it turns out that uh, the group of Klaus Seidel uh, from Düsseldorf and uh, Jans Michaelis and others have done a really good job at narrowing down all these sources of errors and getting actual, not distant changes, but actual static distances to a pretty good level of about one angstrom or even sub-angstrom. These are not small dyes. Those are dyes that are good for single molecule experiment. That means they are bright, they, they need to be relatively large so that you get enough photons per second to do this. Very small dyes are actually better in some ways because you don't need long linkers, you know more or less where they are, but you have to do measurements on the ensemble level, not on single molecule level. Yes, here. Would it be far-fetched to expect that X-ray movies Dr. could be done? So I had a short discussion with Wa. I think that the concept of stop flow or continuous flow mixing for non-equilibrium applies for all structural methods. It's hard, but for cryo-EM, I think it's going to be easier. Uh, for for X-ray crystallography, that will be much harder. But people have done enzymatic work inside crystals. So if you have a, a pre-crystal and now you do some change, that's okay. I don't think it will be suitable for transcription, but for some enzymes, yes. Um, but I think that structural biology is really primed to go to dynamic structure. Okay, thank you all for attending this amazing session. To all.